we are a matter of hours away from the resumption of Premier League football with a trip to Goodison Park, the latest task for Eric Ten Hag's Reds. We're looking ahead to that fixture, diving face first into Sir Jim Radcliffe, John Murtaugh, a disgruntled squad, and answering your questions on episode 180 of the Stratycast. All right. Following the latest break in elite European football, fans of the club game can rejoice at the prospect of four months without another international break, Dale. For Manchester United, Wednesday brought welcome images of Luke Shaw and Lissandro Martinez training ahead of their highly anticipated first team return. But when a host of raids travel the world with their countries, the unknown variable of the future of this club continued to steal the majority of football headlines. Now, fresh off the back of news that Richard Arnold will relinquish his position at the end of the year, fans of Star Trek lifted their heads in wonder at the prospect of Patrick Stewart stepping into an interim role. Now, shortly after that announcement, it was largely suggested that John Murta would be following Arnold out the door. Although, despite multiple conflicting reports, namely a fairly noticeable one from James Ducker at The Telegraph, Murta is apparently anticipating playing a pivotal role in any potential Ineos arrival, with the suggestion that he is hoping to make additions of his own to United's existing recruitment team as part of major changes to the scouting setup. Now, Dale, this is something we speak about quite a lot. And given the financial commitments that it would take to sever ties with the United Chief, coupled with the timing, what is your take on the future of Murta at Old Trafford? His days are numbered, Sean. And I know that you'll get the few stories out there from, I think, come the press back, the people that are there are take what United give them and, and run it as gospel. Um, th- what I'm hearing with Marto is his days are numbered. Now, United may decide to do that in a kind of a, a weeding out period and, and do it over a period of time. But I think when Sir Jim Ratcliffe comes in, he plans to hire a number of experts in several fields especially sporting directors there's now talk of maybe two coming in from what i understand paul mitchell is, is definitely coming to united um he's back living in manchester he he's one that i can definitely see coming in as for who else comes in i'm not sure but on marto i don't think um he will be part of the future of the club and i think you have to look at it too he was very lucky to get the job at united what did he do prior to that? He worked at Everton, did a lot of work with the, the U team there. But as a, dire- a football director, he has that role in the biggest club in Europe. And I think some of the people that we are being linked with, other sporting directors, uh, even Dougie Friedman from Crystal Palace, he's a better CV than John Murtaugh. I just don't, I, I see, I think if there's any chance of him staying on, he will not be in a significant role whatsoever. But in the context of it all, I mean, I'll agree with you. I can't see him staying on. But when you're when you're looking at the likes of Docker reporting in the Telegraph, I had a feel like he was fairly confident in what he was putting on paper. And be it that Murta is, is not fully aware of what's going to happen or if he's just trying to put on a strong face, he's speaking like a man who feels like he's going to be there for quite some time. Now, I find it very, very hard to believe, given all of the changes that are going to be happening in the back room, that he can be anything other than his days are numbered, as you said. But like fans want immediate change. Fans want action. Is it really something that we can suspect is going to be as quick timing as Arnold going out the door? Or are you looking at a far more, I suppose, a slower transition towards him leaving? Or do you think this is a plaster off and just get the job done? I think once... This deal is is set and announced, whether it's six or eight weeks after the Premier League gives its own approval or, or shorter. I think Ratcliffe needs to get the people that he wants in ASAP. And there's talk of, of wanting to have plans in place for the, the January transfer window, which I believe because Ratcliffe comes into this job knowing that for years, Manchester United's recruitment team has been under severe scrutiny. And it's one of the one of the elements that he believes within you us and their kind of view on on sport and integrity, that they can fix that. So I really think that this can happen quickly. That the people that he wants to come in, the likes of um 
Blanc that worked previously at Juventus and PSG. Brailsford, who we're going to talk about shortly. I, I suspect they will come in pretty quickly to the top part of Inuas' plan. And as for, for John Murto, I, I just I, I, I can't see realistically him being part of this new new look group. I know there were suggestions in, in Ducker's piece that he could like have his own team near almost and make his own it, it, sum it up really kind of almost simplistically. Radcliffe is getting control of, of sport and operations. And I don't think anybody who has ties to the, the Glazer family will be part of his self. Well, that's the aim and that's the overall hope of myself, yourself and every other fan. And you've just draw mention to Sir David Brailsford, obviously the man who masterminded the success of Team GB at the Olympics, as well as Team Sky's rise to prominence. I mean, he's going to supply one of the most intriguing elements, I believe, of Sir Jim Radcliffe's purchase of the 25% of the club. Now, Obviously, he's a somewhat controversial character, but he's one who's going to look to harness the finest of margins for the maximum gain. And this is something that he is obviously synonymous with. Now, talk to me, Dale. What does his potential arrival do for you? Well, it's it kind of, to be honest, if you look at their body of work, if you look at Sir Dave Brailsford and his, with Team Sky, his history in cycling before Team Sky and the Olympics, and of course, he, he did work with Nice and, and, and they're on to a path to better things this season. But with the whole Inuas image, you're getting apparently what they believe is the best in class. And I think someone of Sir Dave Brailsford's figure, he epitomizes that. You know, the people in sport will, will look up to him. And I think Manchester United will then have people operating the club who around football were, were respected the way we should be, the way the club should be. And I'm not even talking about the team, the recruitment team that's going to be replaced now. But for, for years, Ed Woodward, John Murto even, again. Um, none of these people are, are respected in football. And I think that's something that's going to change. The, the image United have with dealing with football agents and so on, that's all going to drastically change. And it could go one way or the other, but, but I, I do believe it'll be for the better. You obviously drew mention to his integration into the footballing sector because obviously mm. he's a specialist in 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 cycling and what he has done can, can, can never be disregarded. I know there is individuals that are lodged within that sort of a sector that more so like to focus on the nasty side of him and the suggestions of going to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for want of a better word. But you're looking at something that in that particular sport the entire sport is tainted and has been for a very, very long time. Now, obviously, he was never found guilty of anything, although there is questionable tactics in the background with regards to findings and adverse anomalies with regards to paperwork and, and, and records. Does him arriving at the club bring any sort of a disrepute with him? Or is it more so just the focus of what he brings in being able to implement this strategy of long-term scalable achieving growth through making small decisions that ultimately when there's a number of these small decisions made at the one time, collectively they work towards the greater good in moving forward. Yeah, I think the second part of what you were touching on there, I, I, I will go with it. Look, it's very easy to sit back and look at some cycling experts um, coming to United and what that should raise alarm bells for, it just it should be, the authority should be on that. And keeping an extra eye on United, but Sir Brail, Brailsford's not stupid. You know, he's coming to the biggest club in the world. He knows the the microphone or the, the scope will be on him the whole time. So, look, I think this sounds like a plan of getting the best of cl best in class in through the door and everyone working together towards the greater good of the club. Now, it's all it, it, look, we're also talking about this in kind of an idealistic way that, of course, we have to mention that the Glazers are still there. And, and and still own a, a major share in the club. So it will be interesting over these months that when Brailsford, Blank, Radcliffe and whoever else is there, maybe Mitchell, when they set their demands, it's going to be interesting to see how the club operates and and, and, and which which kind of control Joel Glazer has over certain decisions that maybe Radcliffe will want to make down the line when it comes to maybe investment or 
we, we, these are things that are long down the line, but they're obviously questions that, that we have. And they're perfectly valid questions. We're, we're looking at a scenario where, as you've made reference to a couple of times about being the best in class, and mm-hmm. these are individuals that pride themselves on that best in class situation. Maybe one side that looks massively advantageous with him coming in is that he's almost cut his cloth in the footballing environment over in France. Now, there was a slow start, but as we've seen, it has come to fruition, and maybe this is something that we can look towards at Manchester United. This is what I'm making reference to, because I can't see someone like him coming in and making drastic changes, because ultimately, if you make drastic changes, there's going to be massive ramifications of that. It's about making small changes. And one of the things I really want to focus on, and it's another topic that I wanted to focus on in here, is how he looks towards cultivating harmony. Okay, Anybody who knows this guy's background knows that he has fledged this characteristic of a harmonious environment for whatever teams he's involved in, okay? Because he realizes that having a harmonious environment is one that is going to supply advantageous outcomes in moving forward. And this is how couples side by side in making small, tiny changes here and there, coupled with an overall environment of people accepting these changes is how you move forward. Now, when we speak about harmonious and we look at the squad, I think it's impossible not to be haunted by stories of the past and the suggestion of player power. Now, I say this because, as you're more than aware yourself, it has been suggested that the current crop is unhappy with Ten Hag and his training measurement, particularly during pre-season. And apparently, that has now been scaled as blame for our lackluster form. Given everything that we know, it's all a little bit familiar, Dale, isn't it? Well, we've heard the same thing on the previous managers. Maybe not point for point the exact same, but... There was complaints under Jose Mourinho's training. There was complaints under Van Gaal's. There was complaints under Ollie's. And for me, that's just a trend of players that don't want to take responsibility. The report in which you're referring to, however, came from The Guardian, um, a friend of the podcast, Jamie Jackson. And the one thing that irked me about the report, um, and nothing to do with Jackson because he did his job and he reported on, 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 on the news, but in the piece, he states that, that none of the players have made their complaints known to Ten Hag. So basically what they've done is they've ran to the closest journalist they could find and they'd rather comf- or tell, tell him about their complaints to Ten Hag than go to the manager himself. And I think that that, again, to me, doesn't show that Ten Hag is the issue. It shows that it's these players and they're not even going about their issues the right way run into the media it's kind of ironic that i would complain about that as as a writer myself but i'm looking at your question about team harmony and i i see these players complaining about ten hags coaching it's nonsense it's absolute i'm not even there but it's nonsense because time and time again managers come to this club they over a period of time they're trying to introduce their own methods and then it gets to a point where the players are having not having any of it and they've had enough, and we get bad results, and they never want to blame themselves. But I hope, and a lot of people I speak to, Sean, I think you're similar as well, but a lot of people I speak to are catching on to this. And Ten Hag is getting a lot of support from United fans that I speak to, that I know, and are desperate to see him overcome this. And I think there's also a, a desperate plea as well that certain players don't overcome this. Because there's a few that they might just have enough of. And it's easy to point where some of these leaks are coming from. And they're the players that Ten Hag wanted out in the summer. And they're the players that Ten Hag will want out again, either in January or next summer. And how funny is it that we still have these leaks after what we have gone through over the last 12 to 18 months, where you've had players leaving such as Paul Pogba, Jesse Lingard, just to name two of many, many a certain goalkeeper that we spoke about quite a lot on this podcast also followed suit. And these were the individuals with Henderson, with the rest of the boys, that we constantly lamented with regards to dressing room leaks and an inability to be able to fledge their frustrations on a training field to show the coaching staff and the management that you're making a mistake in not selecting me. I.e., you look now towards the likes of Jaden Sancho, and it's further solidifying this age-old adage of this squad 
And it's a legacy issue that seems to be carried over year after year. And it, there's no benefit to this whatsoever. When you're talking about this report from Jackson and, and, and you're talking about how many group of players, I don't know how many players, but that they couldn't just muster the courage to be able to have a conversation with the coaching staff as opposed to going out and just leaking this. It's unnecessary. It's causing carnage. It's causing more frustration and something you touched upon as well, because I do believe it as well. And I'm a firm backer of this. It drives me more into the corner of the manager and the coaching staff than that of the players, because all it's doing is it's hammering a divide between the players and the fan base. And all we want to see as supporters is players trying. We want to see players going out, giving their all in the training field and whoever is selected on the day going out and giving their all against the teams that we're playing against. When we're reading time after time after time again, the same old stories, it harbors this fundamental issue, which is what we were speaking about for the previous 15 minutes. And this comes from the top down in looking at the likes of Railsford coming in and looking at the likes of Mitchell coming in, talking about the fundamental changes that we needed in the back. And we need to be able to look at acquiring players for this squad, alleviating this old back one of, of dropping 100 million on a player, dropping 350,000 a week on a player and working towards a system whereby we have a certain style and a characteristic of player willing to come to this club and work to a certain ethos. 100% and on that as well, and a player that will work to a certain ethos, but I know I made comparisons quite a bit to when Jorgen Klopp arrived at Liverpool. But just, there's two of them are stylistic managers, but if you look at the team that he came into with Liverpool, he had so many changes to make. He wanted to make them super energetic, and those players that he had at the time weren't, he, he quickly learned that they weren't capable of carrying out those demands. They just weren't capable. You had to quickly move them on, find new players that fit those plans. And I think with some of these complaints that are in the report, just to detail them, the players are supposedly given out about being overworked during preseason. They, they felt going into the season that they were just as tired as they were when they finished the previous campaign. But you're at the biggest club in the world. You finished third last season. So as a result, you should expect that when you come back, you're going to be made work harder. You know, those players should go back expecting that and and wanting that. When United were successful, that's how the players had, that's how they were tuned in mentally. They knew they would have to work hard to, to hit, hit those heights. I think we have too many players that are happy with sitting in mediocre positions season after season, as long as they're getting their paycheck and they're getting their Instagram likes and they're getting their publicity from playing from United. But I think that's what Brailsford and, and Radcliffe and, and Cole need to sort is, is not just personnel, but there needs to be a mentality shift. I know what, what we called for previously in terms of an ownership situation is we wanted a cultural reboot. That won't happen because the Glazers remain. And like I raised a point recently or a few minutes ago, I don't, we don't know how it's going to exactly work with Radcliffe and Inuos and, and the Glazers, but they still remain. The cancer still exists. But what I hope to see with Radcliffe on, on the sporting side of things is that he can sort out that mentality because it comes from the top right down to the bottom. You can even see it in the atmosphere on match day, some, some games. 100%. And when, when we look at this particular report as well, Dale, and we're we're looking at players that are complaining about the preseason, the the training regiment, and 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 the workload that's been put on them. It's easy then for we'll say naysayers to Ten Hag to come out and say, well, look, they've got a point. Look at the amount of injuries that we have. Look at the 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 backlog and trying to get players out of the physio department and back in the training field. But I want to put something else to you, and this is what I want to put to anyone else who's listening here as well. When we broke for the international break. There was 196 injuries in just over three months. And that's at the start of this season in the top flight in the Premier League. That is a 15% decrease compared with the past four campaigns. Now, when we try to assess this, there's a very, very easy common denominator. And it happened around this time last year when club football broke and everybody just went over to Qatar and played a World Cup, increasing a massive fixture, fixture congestion on all of the Premier League, as well as the other leagues, which has now contributed to a 15% increase. So when I see these players giving this report that they were overworked in preseason, et cetera, et cetera, 
if that is the situation that they're overworked, which I don't believe in any way, shape or form, I more so look at the fixture congestion and the scheduling that happened as a result of a Winter World Cup. And that is the fulcrum of the issue. So the fact that they would look past that and deviate from that and try to leak some sort of a nonsensical article to a journalist that it's the manager's fault and the coaching staff's fault for this, I think it just shows the optimum point of weakness within the core of those players. To be honest, Sean, I think we've pinned it down to these players just being a bunch of lazy bastards half the time. Honestly, yeah. I, th- I, yeah. Think, I think they're being asked to work more harder, which I think is a pretty obvious demand given, yes, last season was a success, but... As Ten Hag said time and time again, it wasn't enough. He wants to be competing for Premier League titles. And this is again back to, to why I, I, I will be pushing the manager more than some of the players, is that these players are the ones that need replacing rather than the manager. A lot of the players. These play, a lot of these players we're talking about will never win domestic titles. Because they don't clearly don't have the hunger for it. Now it's not all. And we have we've had we've had lots of injuries this season and key personnel out. And I know we, we've spoken about it with, with Leach and Luke Shaw coming back. Um these are big, big players that have been out, but it's also very disappointing that the players that have had their chance between the start of the season to, to now haven't really stood up. And I think that when those players return and it comes to players not being happy with game time. They'll only have themselves to blame because now really is the time to be getting brownie points under Ten Hag. And I think a lot of them have missed their opportunity to do that. Saying that, we've the be- we're in the best run of form than any other team in the Premier League at the moment going into the game against Everton this weekend. So it's not all doom and gloom. Um, there's reason to be excited. And I think with Radcliffe coming in, there's a promise of a new chapter, Sean. Oh, 100%, man. And that's exactly what I was going to get onto because... We do have one or two little pain in the arses within that dressing room, but there's a lot of guys that are given their all. And when we turn focus to 4.30 on Sunday and the trip to Everton, you've just touched on it. United have collected 12 points from the last five games, despite a run of questionable performances, somehow remain the form team in the Premier League. Now, on the flip side, Everton, of course, are resuming football fresh off the back of a painful points deduction. But they too have been playing very impressively. Now they've collected 10 points from their last five games. And that's only bettered by Ten Hag's side and their Merseyside rivals by a solitary point. So when we're looking at this game and we're looking at the severity of their punishment, is it fair to suspect an onslaught from the opening whistle on Sunday? Yeah, I I, I think we can expect a response of sorts. And Bruno touched on it in his pre-match kind of preview while he was away with Portugal on international break. That with Everton deducted 10 points, these players are clearly going to react. A trip to Goodison is never easy anyway. Um, so it's going to be more difficult. But, Sean, looking at the next three fixtures, we've got Everton away, Galatasaray away, and I think we're home to Newcastle. Those are three games, and they're almost statement games, so we need to be winning, getting maximum points in. That game against Newcastle, I look at it and thinking that of all the big teams this season, we've kind of fluffed our chances and haven't taken any advantage on them. The only way we're climbing up the table is almost relying on them slipping up from one week to the other. We need to beat these teams. Start beating them now. Start showing that this form that we're in, apparently the best form in the league, let's start proving it. It starts this weekend against Everton. It won't be easy, but we can have no excuses. <clears throat> Come Sunday night, we won't want to be talking about how Everton sparked a reaction. You know what? As harsh as their 10 points deduction is, fuck their 10 point deduction. I hope they get relegated. Um, and I hope we, we contribute to that by taking three points away from Goodison Park at the weekend. Why don't you tell us how you really feel, Dale? <laughs> <laughs> no, but when you look at this game, uh, take, take the last 10 fixtures just for a conversation point. United have a good record against Everton. Like there was there was a solitary defeat in April of last year, and that was at Goodison Park where we fell 1-0 in the league. But when you're looking at the last 10 games, it's the only defeat that we've had. United have won five, there's been four draws, and obviously that solitary defeat last year. You know the brand of football that you're going to get with Everton. Okay, this is the one thing under their manager, because like our own manager and like other managers, he's a stylistic manager. I've, I've heard many press conferences where he's tried to eradicate the prospect of 
he's a long ball merchant and that he only plays to get the best out of the players he has. I think we all know the type of football that you're going to get. And it's going to be a pretty raucous partisan home crowd there on Sunday, given the back of this uh, points deduction. I suppose it's ourselves or Liverpool arriving that could probably raunch him on any more than they could possibly get. But these are the type of games you want. You know, you want these as a supporter and players should want this. If we have any inkling that this squad are looking at this game and thinking, oh God, you know, not really keen on this game this weekend, given what's after happening. They're in the wrong team, they're in the wrong dressing room. Because these are the type of games that you want to play. And realistically, disregarding everything that's after happening, it's a game we should be winning. And we spoke, obviously, with the photographs that broke on Wednesday during the week with Luke Shaw and with Lissandra Martinez. Now, I know Leisha is, is, is not quite there. It's not expected that we're going to see him this side of Christmas. It's likely going to be the new year. But there's every suggestion come this game that we could be looking at Luke Shaw and Rasmus Hoyland in the same team. I'm going back and forward with this with a few different people because I'm laying out the importance of Luke Shaw and just how beneficial he is to this side and this style of play and the transition between, we'll say, goalkeeper to midfield and how important he is in attacking moments. But as JK and myself discussed during the week, which is a perfectly valid point, if Luke Shaw's fit, if Luke Shaw is available and if he's going to start, how likely do you think he's going to be starting as the, the left pairing in the centre-back partnership? It's not a bad show, given what we've seen in recent weeks and with basically Varane being overlooked by Johnny Evans. I know Johnny Evans pulled up a knock just prior to the international break. So, again, it wouldn't be the strangest thing. Last season, we were talking about Luke Shaw keeping Harry Maguire out of the team. I think Harry Maguire is probably one of the first defenders that'll be picked at the moment. So he'll be starting. Um, but I, I, yeah, I wouldn't be against Luke Shaw. The only problem is it's not like we're blessed at left back currently either. You know, Regulun's been injured. We've seen Victor Lindelof back there again, unfortunately. Um, even when Regulun is fit, not really convinced by him. I think he's okay standing, but he's not, he's not definitely not United quality. Shaw really is the only one that's United you know, quality, maybe Malice if he was fit. But I think him and the team, you mentioned that transition. I think it's important to get him in at left back. Um, you could still do that, of course, at centre back too. But I think that would be when we're desperate in desperate need. I think right now he comes back into the team, he's going to left back because I'm, I'm fed up with watching. Dallow, to be perfectly honest with you, I want to see. I want to see. Her, I, I just want to see her back forward the way it should be. With Leeds oh, yes, back, absolutely, absolutely. But I'll tell you, to get Luke Shaw back, to see Martinez back in training, it is promising signs leading into what is a must-win game, just like every other game. But hopefully, to be able to deliver some sort of a substantial performance. And to be able to recoup some of the harm that has been done in some of these unquestionable performances over the past couple of months. Just quickly, I wanted to ask you whether you thought that when Leicher returns, with all the talk we've had about Rafael Varane basically being stripped out of the team, replaced by Johnny Evans and being left on the bench. And yeah, reports are true that he's unhappy and I don't blame him. But again, this is a player coming to the end of his career. When... Leicher returns, do you think the centre-back pairing will be Varane and Leicher or do you think that it will be someone else, maybe Harry Maguire and Leicher? Provided he doesn't leave and reports of him leaving are inaccurate, I, I would think that if all defenders are fit, we'll revert back to what we saw last year. I yeah. It's something that we discussed recently about the importance of having a stable centre-back partnership. You can rotate players in different positions throughout the field. But one thing that is is so important to have consistent is to have a consistent centre-back partnership. A lot of people drew question to why Johnny Evans was playing instead of Varane. And it's something that you and I discussed, and I, and I do firmly believe it. With Varane playing, he's got obvious quality there. He's, he's, he's a born winner. And I don't buy into these suggestions that his frailties were covered up by far superior centre-back pairings that he had throughout the years. Now, technically, he's questionable. He's not the greatest passer of football. His defensive prowess is, is, is unquestionable. But on the football, especially we saw it against Copenhagen in Denmark, he leaves a lot to be desired. 
so in that aspect, he needs to have somebody who's far stronger beside him on the football. If everybody is fit, I know some people are suggesting that maybe Leach goes in beside Harry Maguire. I don't think the two of them complement each other. I think Varane and Leach complement each other. And I think Leach is so confident on the football, even more so than Harry Maguire, because it's something that I want to dive into further. There's an awful lot made about Harry Maguire and how good he is at passing the football. And, and if you look at statistics and the metrics, and it's something that obviously I, I look at quite a lot, he can have a high pass completion rate and, and he can look as though he's comfortable on the football and delivering these cosmopolitan footballs, shifting them across to, to a side player. But so many of his football, so much so many of his passes, I should say, they're predictable. There's an awful lot of his passes that are slow. They're, they're, they're not in the same tempo and they're not in the same forward-thinking mentality of somebody like Martinez. If you put Maguire and Martinez alongside each other, and you really, really analyze the way that they take the football from the goalkeeper and how they look to transition it, it's night and day when you look at those two footballers. Martinez gets the ball, and he fizzes passes into the midfield. He's the definition of a line-splitting defender with the way he passes the football, whereas Maguire dallies on the ball. And he will often look to deliver these slow lofted passes, which allows the opposition to be able to get back in structure, whereas Martinez will look to break that. So that's a long-winded way of answering your question. I think if everybody is back fit, Martinez and Varane will certainly go side by side. I think the reason that Johnny Evans was in there instead of Varane is, is, is looking at the idea of a twofold. One, it's really tidying up for the, the lack of technical ability that he has in passing the football. But also, there's always that little niggling worry that Varane has two or three games in him, and then he's injured. And ultimately, then, it, it, it breaks that cohesion in the centre-back partnership. And I think that's what they were looking at with Maguire and Evans. Now, as you know yourself, ironically, Johnny Evans went off injured. So it just seems to be a bit of a crux at the moment. I mean, in, in your own opinion, when, when Martinez is back, when everybody is fit, do you see... Martinez partnering Varane or do you see Martinez partnering someone else? I'm kind of split with the viewpoint that Varane you only get two or three games out of him anyway. And I think bringing him in can just disrupt things. But I'm splitting it. Obviously, there's no, there's no denying that Varane is a better defender than the vast majority of defenders that we have. I think he's a better defender than Harry Maguire. Um, Harry Maguire is in form right now and, and, and Rafael Varane isn't. But yeah, I, I I I wouldn't be surprised if he was one of the ones that left in the summer. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he if he left in January if, if the right offer came in and he was willing to go to Saudi Arabia. But I don't know how active the Saudi Pro League clubs will be in January because I read something the other day that they'd be kind of waiting to see how all those clubs finish out in their season before they they go big for it again in the summer. Um. So yeah, it'd be interesting to see what happens with not only Varane on that note, but also Casemiro, who again, were without until the new year. Yeah, very valid. But this is all on the premise that if Varane is leaving in January, that they have got a ready and able replacement lined up who's going to come in and who's going to fill the void immediately. Are we looking at somebody like Tobito coming from our, uh, what could very well be a sister club? Conveniently. Conveniently. Yeah. <laughs> 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 We're laughing at this, but it 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 it, it could be a grower, Sean. It's it's definitely a transfer story to keep an eye out for because United will be signing a centre back in two thousand and twenty four. Whether they get one in January or not, it remains to be seen. But I think with a new centre half coming in, there most certainly be one or two leaving the club. What score are you having on Sunday? Is it going to be three points? Is it going to be anything less? That's going to be three points. We have to have a bit of optimism. We have to believe a bit. You know, we are, we have won the last few games in the last six games and the only one we haven't lost is against City, which to be fair, look, going into that game, none of us expected us to win that game. But these ones, we do expect to win. You know, our form, our performances have been poor. You know, getting a few players back from injury now, Luke Shaw, hopefully he's able to start I think we'll win 2-1 at Goodison Park. And I just have one eye on that game in Istanbul against Galatasaray. I'm nervous about that one, Sean, but I suppose we just stick to the Everton game for now. Every game is a cup final already, but in reality, four points off fifth, five points off fourth, 
seven points off top. A win changes the atmosphere massively, particularly with some of our key rivals going to be facing off against each other this weekend mm. as well. So the same for three points. Ideally, we get a performance. Great if we could see Luke Shaw back and Rasmus Hoyland fully fit and firing. And if he can break that duct in the Premier League, as we know he's he's going to do and going to do so very well. So I'll go along with you. I'll say it's going to be a win. It's going to be a fairly rowdy atmosphere, I'd imagine. I'm looking forward to it. Now, Dale. Shall we dabble on some listener questions? Yes, we shall. There's many to select from, my man. Many to select from. And we have Paddy in Limerick. And he's asking, and it's actually fairly fitting based on what we're talking about. He said, given the nature of the injuries to the squad, just how important to Eric Ten Hag's system are his defenders, namely that of the returning Luke Shaw and Lissandro Martinez. Now, I know we've just touched on this, but I want to elaborate. And Paddy, hopefully he won't kill me for this. He's asking how important they are. Now, if I add to the question for you, how important are they when we look at the overall performances and the lack of perceived cohesion and tactical ploy of this squad? Just how important are the defenders when we consider that side of it, Dale? Massively. Every every top team builds from the back. They start building from the back. And I think that's what Ten Hag has tried to do this season. He brought in his goalkeeper that he wanted after a year of the Gea. Last season, we've seen Leicha come in, players like Tyra Malasia that can play his style of football. And we were all hoping that, you know, United would start playing with the high line. We'd start to see Onana spraying balls out from the back. And the biggest problem or disruption to that is we haven't had the defence um, suited to playing that football as a result of injuries. And that alone is a proof in the pudding of how important his defenders are. And... We banged the drum for weeks and weeks, Sean, about Leach and, and Shaw being absolutely crucial to getting back. They're the two players that were missing the most. There's no two ways about it. I think your question raises an important note that I think people need to be focused on a bit more. That yes, defenders are absolutely crucial. And if you look at some of the other coverage other clubs get in the Premier League, for instance, Tottenham Hotspur, They've had a few injuries in the last few weeks. I think Madison and, and, and Son being, being the two main ones. But there are two injuries they have. People are pinpointing how they're not getting results as a result of it. They're not saying that about Manchester United. They're tearing absolute strips out of us and overlooking key points. Key points as injuries, not just injuries, but injuries to very, very important players. That make us tick. We've been without them. And I'm... Just that talk of, of Shaw coming back, um, you should hear my voice, the excitement, and, and that should tell you how important it is. Absolutely. And and it's it's a brilliant point that you're that you're making about Spurs, because they're the media darling at the moment, aren't they? They're the they're the new shiny thing with a manager that has a lot about him, in all fairness. He seems like a good bloke. But a couple of injuries, all of a sudden, you've lost two games in the bounce. And when you're looking at, we'll say, a form perspective over the last five games that we've made mention to with Manchester United, with Everton, United have 12 points over the last five games. Spurs have nine. And that is after two injuries. Manchester United have spent the vast majority of this season with up to about 12, 13 injuries to first-team squad members. And Prior to the international break, we had nine out going into that game against Luton. That's a, it's a big number of injuries to have to a squad, you know? It's a colossal number of injuries and I know we should be well used to it at this stage that it's just easier right negativity to be able to, to generate traction and clickbait. But at some point, the people that are totally and utterly content in getting clickbait have to give a little bit of sympathy towards Ten Hag and the, the inability that he has because, you know, it's something that I'm very passionate about. The numbers, the statistics, the formations, the tactics, everything that makes a football game tick. And and as I have explained previously, this is a man that quite clearly wants to to move towards his three one six. You know, he wants that IX three one six. It's looked very much like a three two five at the best of times for United when he's playing it. But absolutely critical to that in that three backup is that he has ball playing defenders who are able to facilitate transitions between the goalkeeper, the defence, the midfield, to be able to launch these scaled attacks that can lead to making the pitch smaller in the opposition third when we do not have the football. And when you're missing Luke Shaw, you're missing Aaron Wambasaka for how long? You're missing Leicha. You've got Raphael Varane who struggles to be the leading man with the technical ability on a football. 
And to answer the question, I feel that the defender is missing is, is beyond critical. It's beyond crucial to the type of football that Ten Hag wants to play. Because ultimately, if you don't have that bedrock in the back to be able to play the ball around technically and build these attacks, it completely cuts the head off the snake. And it's about as bad a situation as Ten Hag could have got. I think the return of these players, particularly Luke Shaw, who I've been beating a drum about for a very, very long time, is going to be absolutely colossal. And something we spoke about earlier on in this podcast, that he could sit in in centre-back, even though we would be missing his marauding runs down the left wing, the way he carries the football, to have him as that option between Andre Onana and the midfield would be huge because technically there were fewer defenders who have the ability on the football that that man has. And even with those runs, it's it's going to be a big, big boost having him back into the team for Marcus Rashford. You know, oh, he's yeah. someone that 100%. is getting so much stick this season. And I think you did a piece on it earlier on the campaign. I will, Rashford was missing Shaw, but I, I, I can't wait for that element of it because I look at Rashford and I just think he's a million miles away from where he would be if, if Shaw was in the team as well. I could not agree more. And while I'm not going to say that is the sole reason that Rashford is playing poorly because Rashford has to shoulder a lot of the blame himself, mm. when, when, when you're signing those contracts and becoming a leading man for the biggest club in, in, in English and European and world football, Yes, okay, you're you're being handicapped ever so slightly by having a partner in crime who marauds down the wing with you. But at the same time, you have to be able to shoulder the blame and put your hand up and say that I'm not playing as well as I can. And a lot of this is my fault as well. But he needs to be able to cock his chest out when he's saying that and say, I'm going to improve. Now, I want to look as well at a second question. And the previous podcast, uh, Fabiola, put through a very, very good suggestion. She done so again. And it's it's something that we've actually discussed. I think we could probably go back two or three years ago talking about this deal. But Fabiola says, with all the changes around the club, should United also change strategy on the youth system and highlights a focus on the South American market with a much better budget for youth signings? And I think it is an absolutely brilliant question and something that you implore yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I think United should be definitely in that South American market. I think Chelsea are... I dip it into it each summer now. City have started as well with players like Julian Alvarez that have come to Premier League and I think most United fans would take him in a heartbeat and reckon he would be a great player for United, but we weren't in the race for him. Um, Moises Caicedo is another player that United missed out on from the South American market. So yeah, look, there's proof in the pudding there why United should be monitoring South America a lot, lot closer. But with the whole recruitment side of things and what we spoke about earlier on this podcast about who's coming in. Paul Mitchell probably doesn't have the greatest pool of of, of, of work done in South America. Though before he left Monaco, they did sign a few South Americans. So I'm not sure if there'll be a specific focus from him on that, but if there's talk of other sporting directors coming in, you never know. I know it's something that Eric Ten Hag has, has asked for. It's something he's raised with United that he looks at Man City and looks at Chelsea since he's come to United and he sees that the work that they're doing and the work they're doing to bring in young South American talent. And it it's definitely an area, and you'll agree with me, Sean, that United just seem to seem to be quite dormant on. You know, United are are are, are identifying these players. They're identifying the the Julian Alvarez is in, in good time because we're being linked to him. I think the biggest problem that our scouts feel, and this is from speaking to scouts as well, that when they report names, they feel as a result that it's just it's never followed up. So when it gets to the Glazers, there's just whatever, whoever gets that, there's a breakdown, not interested. And that's something that maybe we can hope for with a new recruitment team is it's very simple, but what we're asking for is better dialogue. The two players that you really have to look at over the last couple of years is you draw mention to Julian Alvarez, but also Enzo Fernandez. And a certain Austrian manager during his time at Manchester United identified both of these players for a far, far lesser value than what they went for. I also believe that Moises Caicedo was on the radar as well around that particular time. And mm -hmm. down to that dialogue and the lack of communication between top tier to bottom, led to us missing out on these players. Now, this is the great hope, isn't it? It's the great hope that if we can get this best-in-class framework happening behind the scenes, 
then maybe just maybe we can start identifying these young guys and another one i want to look at as well you know like is brighton are fantastic at identifying these players they obviously brought in caicedo they have another beautiful beautiful paraguayan footballer his name escapes me right now as i'm saying this but he's the attacking midfielder unfortunately injured for him at the moment yet another beautiful footballer that costs less than 10 million and we're missing these opportunities and i think we have to look past this old adage that is at manchester united yeah, where united can't buy young unestablished players to come into the first team because it doesn't fit the repertoire that we have we need to look past that and realize that we are a football club that used to go by this whole adage and if you're good enough you're old enough so whether or not they're coming through our youth system or whether we're identifying 17 18 19 year olds that are just exceptionally brilliant at football something needs to change 100 percent, and it goes back to what i was saying about a cultural reset so much needs to change I remember I was speaking to, funny enough, a South American agent who, who had players at Manchester United in recent years. And I raised this point with him when I started looking into it three or four years ago about why Manchester United weren't, you know, after getting that, after finding that hidden gem with, for example, Javier Hernandez, why weren't we not going back to Mexico? Why are we not looking at South American for, so, for something similar? It didn't cost much, so like... There's not, there's not much risk involved for United to go dipping into that market. So I was always quiz, quizzing people and puzzled as to why. And his feedback was quite blunt that United just aren't interested in that. And it goes back to what you were saying. United are just interested in finding names that will that are established already and that will sell more jerseys and whatnot. But I remember, and I, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's a great response because I remember when Hernandez joined and he hit the ground running. And we did pre-season tours in America and whatnot. And the Mexicans went absolutely crazy for him. You know, there, there was, there was, um, trust me, there was no problem with the amount of shirts that Javi Hernandez sold while he was playing for Manchester United. There was, he was probably one of the best sellers. You know, so if we can take some kid out of some town in Brazil or Argentina or whatever, there's no reason why at Manchester United we can't make his shirts sell so I never quite got that and I think I think ultimately what it falls down to and the reason why United were not doing this is incompetence it's a, a lack of care um, in several departments and people just not, not doing their job Sean which I hope is the biggest change that we see is finally United operating like a football club is that too much to ask for I hope not no it's not and thankfully, while you were talking there, the name of the Brighton footballer came to me because it would have bothered me now terribly. It's, it's the Julian Ciso, you know, 19 years of age. And he's a prime example of what you're making about Javier Hernandez. This is a 19-year-old from Paraguay. You know, there's not too many Paraguayan footballers, if any, have played for Manchester United. And that gives you an opportunity to open up into that spectrum, into that world where... There's a whole lot of people who wouldn't mind buying a Manchester United shirt with that boy's name on the back of it. And at 19 years of age, you get him for pennies. I know there's always a Manchester United tax, but it's a far cry from what we've been doing. Now, finally, Pete Royal on Twitter has asked, and this is one that uh, even the prospect of it kind of irks me. Given the changes expected behind closed doors, do we believe in the suggestion that Eric Ten Hag will not be manager in 2024-25. Dale, do we believe in this suggestion? Is it a real possibility? Yes, it's a real possibility. I think Ten Hag, he knows what he needs to do. He needs to win football matches. I don't think his job is under threat now. I think, and I hope, the Radcliffe and his team come in and they decide from the start they're going to back this manager. I believe that they have every reason to believe that they will because... They previously approached him when he was manager of Ajax to come to Nice, which he turned down. So there's, there was interest there. They're, they're a fan of his work. Um, he's been a candidate for previous jobs before. So I think he will get the back end. But Sean, he needs to win matches. I think he knows himself that he's not, he's not, he hasn't got enough wins this season. Too many defeats. And we can battle this curve, but we, we, we do need to see, um, to see better results. I think it's definitely a possibility. It's a possibility none of us want to talk about, but of course, of course it could happen. It could definitely happen. We've seen, we, 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 for instance, I don't think it's going to be as bad as what happened at Chelsea. 
<laughs> but you had Thomas Tuchel who won a Champions League. And there's a tendency when you see a, a shake up in ownership that there's a new, there's managerial changes. It, 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 it's a high tendency. And it came, came at Tuchel's doorstep when he really didn't expect it after winning the Champions League. So I don't think, to answer your question or answer, it's a Paddy or Patrick's question. Uh, or Peter, sorry. Uh, Peter, Peter, Peter Royal. Yeah, Pete, sorry. Um, to answer your question, I don't think there's any manager that's safe, especially in these circumstances. And I think at Manchester United, certainly not. But I think Ten Hag, in his first season, has earned enough credit to overcome whatever happens this term. I want to see him given the next transfer window at the very, very least, Sean. Let's be realistic as well. It's it's a very funny one, isn't it? Because watching the games and the frustration that comes from individual performances coupled with what is perceived as a lack of cohesion. The last five games in the league, we've won four and lost one form team in the league. Whereas when you consider the five games prior to that, there was two wins and three losses. And when you couple the two wins and three losses with the disappointment that we've had on the continent in the in the Champions League, it makes it a far lot worse. I think there was an awful lot of people surprised with the statistic when it broke just coming up to the international break that Manchester United were yeah. the foreign team in the Premier League. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, there was an awful lot of people. Now, as, as you know, this is something that I, I do for a living. So it's it was something I was aware of. But But then when I saw the complete outcry of individuals thinking, what? You know, and I think it was the BBC actually broke it first, in fairness to them, because they saw an ideal opportunity. So hopefully whichever one of them inside in the office decided to break that little doozy, got a nice little bonus. But yeah. it's um, it's hard to actually put it into focus when you're watching what you're seeing and you're seeing so much calamity, yet it is a side that is topping the form charts in the last five games, which is bizarre. When, when, I, when I read the question, this came right off the back of me actually uh, speaking with an individual three days ago and I was speaking to yourself afterward and this individual I kind of have a little bit of, of promise in what they would say and he's got it from more than one individual source that Ten Hag won't be manager next year I don't know what to believe about it I mean it's 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 easy to put two and two together and get 50 and obviously with the shake-up that's happening behind the scenes with the individuals that are coming in and touted to be coming in is it plausible of course it's plausible but like you said yourself, even if you were to disregard what you witnessed this year, he's earned enough of credence in what he's done last year. And I'll say it time and time again, the man overachieved last year. I don't care how much money was spent. It's not his fault that there was individuals signing off on deals that should have never been signed off on. Okay, The incompetence of decision makers in the background couldn't be held at the feet of the manager. He overachieved last year. And I do firmly believe that what I touched upon with this 15% increase in injuries based over the last four years, this World Cup has affected an awful lot. The players should be better than they are. As I said in the last podcast, Dallow missing his man at the back post against Copenhagen. Like Ten Hag, that's not Ten Hag's fault that Dallow missed that, but Ten Hag will be blamed for it. Marcus Rashford being sent off against Copenhagen. That's Rashford's fault. And ultimately, we can go back and forward with various individuals as to whether it was the correct decision or not. But Rashford did that and Ten Hag will be blamed for that. I truly, truly hope that the results that we've had in form will turn into performances because if we can start displaying some bit of backbone, some steel and some bit of cohesion on the football field to go along with the, the remarkable run of form that the club has been in, then I think a lot of people will turn away from this and a lot of people will start realising that, you know what? We're getting some players back from injury. You know, Luke Shaw is coming back. This player is coming back. This player is coming back. And all of a sudden, we might start looking like a side again. One thing as well, and it's something like we, we've no reason to really be speaking about in this particular context, but Safi and Amrabat was someone that everyone was very, very excited to see. And there's a lot of individuals, including yourself, who have been uninspired by what they have seen. I think it's worthwhile noting that he's probably one of the biggest victims of the injury crisis that we've had at this club because he has come in. He's not really had any time to be able to breed himself into this squad and to be able to harness his real strengths because he's been essentially a plaster. And he's literally covering over wounds 
of injuries all over the football field and been made to complete duties because he has versatility about him. And I think he's another one that could really benefit from the defenders coming back, coupled with the fact that Casemiro is, is going to be unavailable. And I think there's more to come from him, so I wouldn't write him off just yet. I hope you're right and I hope I'm wrong. And just like that, that is everything for today as we're going to look ahead to another chapter of the Premier League, the latest installment in the Manchester United soap opera. I've been Sean Connolly, and if you'd like to have a chat, you can reach me at seanconnolly85 on Twitter. Our beautiful boy Brian was otherwise occupied today, but I know he'd love to hear from you all at Day Tripping Red. And Dale, how can folks say hello? You can come follow me on Twitter at O'Donnell Dale. And make sure you subscribe to the Stratycast on all the podcast platforms. And as well as that, I keep mentioning it in recent shows. If you can leave us a review, five-star review, it goes a long, long way. Thanks again for listening. And you'll hear from us again after the international break. <laughs>